Hell no. There we go. Look at that. Yeah. Rock and roll, brother. Hell no. Is right. <laughs> hey, it's great to meet you, man. How's life? You know, right now, not too bad. You know, taking it as it comes, you know, one day, one minute, one hour at a time. But no, it's very well. Uh, how about yourself? Everything's great. Where, where are you coming out of? I live in Southwest Florida. Just, Wonderful. Uh, just outside of Sarasota. Where, where are you from? Where I'm in you? Kansas City, Missouri, right in the middle of the map. Got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So dead I, center, as they say. That's right. We are dead center. If we need to get out, we got exit strategies everywhere. <laughs> oh, man. So I've been down to C.S. the Key. I, that, that's a beautiful area of the world. Yeah, it's right where I am. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually live in Nokomis, which is about uh, 10 to 12 minutes south of C.S. the Key. Okay, wonderful. Well, man, I'm so excited to dive into your life, and I want to begin this by asking you how you survived the last three and a half years. How did you get through the pandemic, and how did it change you? Okay. Sounds good. Are, are we are we off? We're going. Now. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I come from jazz radio, so once I hear that hi-hat, I just I just dive right in. Good. Okay. Um, well, thanks. Thanks. Um, for asking question, you know, that question, Joe, I'll tell you, man, the last, the last three years, I've been honestly um, engulfed in a book writing process and then promoting the book. So um, this past weekend actually was the one year anniversary of the launch of the book. So it's been out for about a year. The book's entitled Age Well and Feel Great, The Proven Path to Solving the Aging Puzzle and Going the Distance. And I'll say prior to deciding to write the book, I think, honestly, the pandemic, um, COVID, I think, was part of my inspiration because what I saw around me was, you know, increasing levels of ill health, um, increasing levels of chronic disease, more dysfunction. This is something I've spent a good percentage of my life thinking about. And so I was inspired to write the book prior to that, working on some courses. So to be very honest with you, I kind of had blinders on and yeah. I was just thinking like, I've got work to do. Let's get to work. And, you know, that being said, um, I'm a musician and missing out on the opportunity to, to be playing with other folks to see our symphony hall shut down, you know, a lot of gigs, uh, obviously business is impacted. Uh, broke my heart. And I think like a lot of people, I tried to surround myself with like-minded people. And we said, hey, we'll get through this together. Yeah. So you, obviously, as you've mentioned, you're an author, musician, speaker, coach. There's a lot going on. But if I put you in front of a bunch of third graders at career day and one of the kids said, what do you do for a living? How would you answer that child? I would say I try to make the world a better place. I try to leave it better than I found it. I try to be the change I want to see in the world. And I can do that in a lot of different ways, right? I can do that sharing music. I can do that uh, friending someone who may need a friend at any moment in time. I can do that through my writing to try to impact lives and my coaching. Um, I love music, of course. And I, I was attracted to, you know, uh, the, the title of your show simply because I'm a huge jazz fan. I mean, if I go back to, you know, 18 years old, studying uh, jazz drumming with the legendary Alan Dawson in, in wow. Boston, uh, when I was, uh, you know, at, at uh, school at the uh, Conservatory of Music, but hanging out at Berkeley and trying to learn as much as I could about some amazing uh, music, you know, going on in my life at that time and all around me, and certainly in the city of Boston, man, you know, jazz was was booming everything was happening in the 70s you know but I think the thing is is you know I just got over uh, um, or just through three different concerts this past weekend with our local Venice Symphony Orchestra and I was reminded how music is it's cliche Joe right but music is the universal language man uh, you can go anywhere in the world and yeah. you can play and all of a sudden you bring people together mm -hmm. right and there's this there's something that happens and I've experienced it many times. I remember in 1989 traveling to the Soviet Union as a member of the U.S. Coast Guard Band, and we were the first American military band to travel to the Soviet Union, and it was incredible. I mean, we, you know, we we broke open our cases and climbed off the bus and you know set up to perform a concert, you know, right right there in the center of what was at the time the city of Leningrad is now St. Petersburg. 
and crowds just formed and people, you know, they, we were, you know, in many respects, the first Americans, these uh, Soviet citizens had ever seen. And yet uh, there was an instant connection um, and there was applause and there was true uh, heartfelt appreciation. And that is something that I think is amazing. So to be very honest with you, I would talk to that third grader. I'd say, just like I told my kids, like, what is it that gets you really excited? Like when you think about something like, how does like time instantly stand still, but it goes by really fast. Do more of that. Think about that, you know, and just, just try to be, just try to be a friend. Just try to be kinder. So what did you want to be in the third grade? What was your dream to grow up and become? Oh, drummer. Yeah. No, I mean, for music, you know, music was me from, from the very beginning. I was very singularly focused. I didn't, I mean, I wasn't athletic as a kid. I didn't do sports. Um, and I often tell the story as a senior in high school of, um, almost not graduating because I, I couldn't complete the mile run in gym and I needed to do that in order to pass gym class. Think about that as a senior. I've now done nine Ironman triathlons and I have a 239 marathon, a Boston marathon, a personal best. Uh, and of course I've written that book, but that all emanated from something that happened a little bit later in my life. At 25, I made a conscious decision to die healthy. So that's kind of what spurred that whole change. But Man, as a third grader, it was all drumming. You know, any anything that I could find to beat on, I, I was beating on it. <laughs> what was the first live jazz show you saw that blew you away? Oh my gosh! No, I don't, I don't remember. Um, but I'm sure uh, it was in Boston, um, and I'm sure it was at that. And I can't even think of the name of it now. What what is now long since gone on Boylston Street, but uh, I think of it as like Boston's version of, you know, Blues Alley or, um, you know, the Vanguard. But um, and of course, you know, honestly, in high school, I went to New York City often and went to the village. And, you know, at, at that time, I mean, Joe, I don't know how old you are, but at that time in the 1970s, you could you could walk around, you know, Greenwich Village and literally stand on the sidewalk outside these these jazz clubs Um I remember actually vividly, uh, uh, you know, standing out there and it was probably one o'clock in the morning and, you know, looking at, um, I think it was, um, I think it was McCoy Tyner and Ron Carter on bass, McCoy Tyner on piano. Um, and they're just playing and, yeah. you know, you could, you could stand out. I mean, I, you know, there was very little in, in the way of a cover charge at that time, but I remember, you know, friends and I just, we would, you know, we would take the train down and just walk around the village and then find our way home at the end of the night. Um, those were days that are, you know, long since gone, gone, obviously, you know, a lot of those, lot of those clubs are still there, but, um, you know, cover, cover charge is a little different than it used to be and access is a little different. Yeah. But no, I remember that kind of thing, you know, uh, very frequently, but the first one is hard to remember. Yeah, no, that's fine. So who's been a hero for you in your life? Well, my dad, first and foremost, uh, who passed um, 22, almost 23 years ago now from brain cancer. And the book is donate uh, is is um, I really wrote the book in honor of him. Um, and I talk about his life quite a bit. Certainly he was, um, you know, uh, someone that influenced me more than any other, I think, because of his character and integrity and work ethic. Uh, something I learned a great deal about through him. And, and of course, I've had so many uh, great mentors over the years. Some of the people that have been hardest on me, actually, you know, teachers and instructors uh, at school, um, English teachers in high school. I remember a teacher named, his name is Bob Lamparelli. I still talk to him all the time. I had him for a couple of years uh, and he was just really hard and very critical of my writing and I learned so much from him uh, and of course so many percussion and uh, and and drum drum teachers you know almost too numerous to list so if you can meet anybody alive on the planet right now or go to a dream show right now where would you go who would you love to see Oh my goodness. Um, well, you know, I recently uh I recently saw Kenny Loggins in concert, the first concert of his final tour, which he did in Van Wazel in Sarasota. Yeah. 
One of my all-time favorite singers. You know, this is going to catch you off guard. I mean, there's so many people I could think of, some who I know are not performing anymore, but one of my favorite all-time pop singers who I know is really, his health is really struggling right now, and I never saw him live, is Phil Collins. Yeah. You know, I know he's not doing well, you know? No, he's not. And I just saw a tribute band here in my local town of Lee Summit, the home of Pat Metheny. And it was pretty phenomenal. And I'm going through the whole concert. And I'm like, wow, he did so much. He was prolific. What he produced yeah, I mean, and what he did was crazy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned Matheny because one of the first people that came to mind, which is truly one of my heroes in the music world is, I mean, an absolute genius, one of the most legendary of all, uh, Gary Burton. Yeah. Uh, who, of course, was, you know, one of uh, Matheny's mentors as well. And gosh, now I'm thinking I miss Chick Corea so much. I can't believe yeah. we lost uh, I know. that genius, brilliant musician, incredible uh, group leader, uh, iconic, paradigm shifting composer, improviser. Um, but of course, Burton is no longer playing anymore either due to health reasons. Now he's um, shifted his focus to to bonsai trees, uh, um, interestingly enough. But, you know, there's so many, but it's interesting. I, I didn't I had forgotten that Matheny was from was from that part of the country. Burton's from Indiana, I believe. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I saw Chick Corea play with the Kansas City Jazz Symphony back in the late 90s. This is before I was starting to listen to jazz radio, but I wasn't you know, really into it as much. And he, he kept playing and the conductor was trying to get him to stop. And he was waving her off. He, she, she was, I could, if she would, if she could have gone livid with no one there and, and saved her face, she would have done it. But he just kept waving her off and just kept playing. But I could just see the way he, he is, his vibe. He was in it. He's a man of improv. He's not going to stop. He's going, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I always liked his vibe, you know? <laughs> I mean, Korea was, you know, one of the greatest of all time. Um, and, you know, funny story. W one of the last times I saw Korea live was the weirdest musical situation I've ever heard him or maybe anyone in. So um, I'm originally from Southeastern Connecticut. And at the time I was living up there and Mohegan Sun, this large Indian casino had just, you know, opened up a few years earlier, started as a bingo hall. And it was growing. And so they built this new, you know, big portion of the casino. And right in the middle of, of, of the casino, they built what they call the Wolf's Den. I don't know if you've ever been to Mohegan Sun. If you have, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, the Wolf's Den, they kind of created is, is literally this, um, you know, uh, garden filled with, you know, rocks and kind of looked like sort of a, a natural outcropping, if you will. Um, and... Of course, it was just a circular open area in the middle of a casino. And uh, sure enough, they brought in Korea and his acoustic band wow. uh, to play in the wool stand, which was insane because, um, of course, you know, the 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 uh, slot machines are ding, 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 <laughs> you know, all I mean, just just this cacophony of sound. You can barely hear the music. And of course, you know, what's typical for that setting is, you know, um, something a little, you know, heavier, um, where, you know, the, the amplification would just carry above, you know, the, the, the slot machines, but, you know, I here there, I was sitting there, you know, <laughs> I got a beer and I'm sipping on a beer, like a lot of other people. And we're listening to Korea, just do his thing. And all you can hear is this cacophony of slot machines. I'm like, man, what a crazy world. Yeah, yeah? totally. Crazy I world. can see him doing that for sure. So what's your motivation every day? What gets you out of bed? What gets you to do what you want to do, be who you are, and to accomplish what you want to get done. Well, one of the things that I talk about in my book, in fact, um, you know, there's in the book, I talk a little bit about the blue zones, which of course become have become a little bit more uh, well known from uh, since the Netflix series. These are regions around the world where there are more centenarians in theory than in any other place, the, the island of Okinawa and Sardinia and a few other places. I also write a little bit about age beliefs and uh, age stereotypes. And, you know, Joe, it's it's my belief uh, to kind of circle around to your question. 
you know, we all need a reason to get up in the morning. We need a mission. We need, we need a purpose. We need some, something that drives us. And I know that's the question you're asking. For me, it's, it's a combination of two things. It's one, I feel like I have so much to learn, so much uh, room still to grow, so much more to experience. And at the same time, I had this uh, tremendous passion to share what I've learned to this point, uh, to try to make the world a better place around me and, and just give as much as I can. And, uh, you know, being a small business owner, trying to, you know, market the book, market my coaching services and, and reach more people and do more things. Um, you know, I'm struggling like a lot of other small businesses to try to make an impact, uh, to try to generate more revenue. So, I think I'm driven every day by all of those things. So even though as I, I sit here at 64, the last thing in the world I'm thinking about is retirement. I mean, yeah. to me, that's like a dirty word. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean that in, you know, in a purely negative sense as though no one should ever retire, but I do believe that there's something to this, uh, this idea that, you know, um, if we don't have something that really, uh, gets us up in the morning that we're excited about to do, to accomplish, to share, um, then then there's something going to be lacking in there and in, in our life. And inevitably, I think we'll see a maybe a decline in our health, certainly a decline in our emotional uh, health, if I could be so bold as to even say that. But I think, man, you know, for me, it's it's all of those things. It's feeling like in a way, I've just gotten started. I know it sounds crazy, but uh, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, I sense that. What's been your best success story? What's been like the best fan letter response, client response? What's that been for you? Wow. Well, you know, um, I'm very, um, I'm very fortunate to have had the opportunity to impact a lot of lives. If you were to go and like go to Amazon and read the reviews of my book, and I haven't looked at them in a whole bunch uh, in a while. Um but there's a, a tremendous amount of reviews there where folks are very uh, gracious in sharing how the book has really impacted their life. And certainly, you know, for about 10 years or so, I operated a gait analysis lab with a sports physician um, from about 2010 to uh, just before um, moving here to Florida. So it was a little less than 10 years that we actually operated a clinic. And every day during those years, had an opportunity to work with injured athletes and folks who were recovering from surgery or, or, or preparing for some surgery and just trying to feel better physically uh, impacted so many lives, got, you know, tremendous amount of uh, love from all of that. So I think, you know, I mean, you know, Joe, it's, it's sometimes it's as simple as, someone coming up to you and giving you the sincerest thank you imaginable for something that you did or said. Um, and other times it's, you know, somebody doing a testimonial video. In fact, this past weekend, a gentleman, his name is Paul, did a, a video for me um, and it was unsolicited, but he, he, he shared, you know, very organic uh, two and a half minutes or so of words about how the coaching we've been working together on has really impacted his life. One of the one of the things that I ask folks to do in in the aging coaching that I do, naturally we're working on nutrition and exercise, uh, movement related things, and you know all of those elements. But one of the things that I ask folks to do is to journal every day, which for some people is easy, other people it's really challenging. Um, and Paul talked about the idea that he's not a feeler per se. He's not the kind of guy that will sit down and you know, share or journal or write about things that he may be grateful for, or the things that inspire him, or his why, something I talk about in the book or not, which is to say, what's the reason we do what we do? What's our why? For me, for example, it's it's being able to, you know, outrun, you know, my grandson when he's a teenager. Just imagine that, you know, I might be, hell, I mean, I might be in my you know, by 80s at that point, the idea of me, you know, running around the grass and, you know, chasing him down is just like the greatest thing in the world to me to think about being able to do that. So, or just being around for him to create memories. So, but Paul sh shared an amazing uh, video of how this journaling and the other things we're doing together had uh, has not only changed his health, you know, he's dropped 
a lot of weight. He's feeling physically better than ever, but but it's impacted every other aspect of his life, his relationships, how he's in, you know, interacting with with people, and he's he's just more more positive person. He's, um, you know, I have I have one of these sayings that I always try to remind myself, and I know you can relate to this, Joe. Um, whenever whenever I go anywhere, or if I'm going to an event, uh, whether a gig, uh, if I'm going to speak, certainly, um, but even if I'm just going to see some people, I always. I just have this mindset. I remind myself all the time. I have a tattoo that reminds me of it. Um, my my purpose is to walk into that room and heal the room. It's the way I think of it. Yeah. Um, to just be a positive influence there, you know. Yeah. Um, and man, that Paul just talked about how that's impacted his life in a lot of ways. That 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 makes me feel really good. So aside from the personal with your family, what have you done professionally that you're the proudest of? Well, um, as a musician, I will say for a number of years um, when we toured, uh, I basically toured as a ragtime xylophone soloist. Um, and uh, I remember playing a gig once at the... Uh, um, at the Ritz at a conference. It was Midwest Orchestra and Band uh, Clinic, which is one of the biggest conferences in the world for educators and musicians in Chicago and uh, playing solo ragtime in front of a, you know, an audience of about 7,000 educators and fellow musicians. Uh, that was certainly a highlight. Um, I've done a number of recordings, um, a bunch of which are, you know, up up on YouTube and on CDs. And those are, those are great. Um, uh, you know, interestingly, during my career as a member of the U S coast guard band, we had so many gigs that were, um, you know, we, we would just get dropped into, uh, and I don't mean that literally, uh, but sort of figuratively some of the biggest events around the world, for example, being on the uh, the southern coast of England and the northern coast of France for the 50th anniversary of D-Day, uh, you know, being on um, Governor's Island at the tip of Manhattan for the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty, um, and so many other events. I've I've met uh, presidents. I remember um, meeting uh, President Reagan at Yorktown during a summit with he and then President Francois Mitterrand of France. Um, I remember playing at the State Department when the, uh, it was a jazz trio. We were just playing background music. There were, the only people in the room at the time were Cap Weinberger, who was the uh, Secretary of Defense and his wife, uh, Bill Clinton and uh, Al Gore and their wives. Those were the only people in the room. Uh, uh, so, I mean, there's a lot, I've, I've been really fortunate, you know, to just have a lot of those opportunities and you're just, you know, you're just playing, man. And you're like, wow, this is probably not going to happen again anytime soon. You know, yeah. now, I think after that gig, it's funny, like we all got together and they all got in a big, you know, uh, like a big semicircle and we, you know, they took a photo and about a week later, I got an autographed, you know, photograph in the mail from, you know, from those guys from, you know, that had been sent by their staff. But those kinds of things happened a lot. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. So everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, fans, readers, clients, colleagues, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Um, well, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, I think I, I, I think of myself, honestly, um, because I, one of the questions you could ask me, you haven't yet, but. Al, what's the thing that's happened in your life that's probably greatest, you know, most impacted who you are, the person you become? Sure. And I would say there are two events. Both happened in my childhood. One was that I was uh, I was bullied pretty, pretty seriously, uh, pretty severely uh, um, in, during elementary school. There was one one point in time, you know, probably about a a year. Uh, where I would hide out after school for like for like an hour because I knew the kids were going to be out there. And I had about a literally a mile walk home. Um, and I think, you know, to answer your question, I think 
when I think of myself, I think of myself as the as the ten year old that got bullied that's still trying to prove he's tough enough and strong enough. Yeah, you know, um, I share a lot of that vulnerability in the book because I really want to be honest with people. You know, people see me and they go. Uh, you know, you've done the Ironman, you've been to the world championships three times, you coach, I coach a five-time Ironman age group world champion, you know, blah, blah, blah. But reality is I still think of myself as a, you know, a scared kid. Um, yeah. Try to, you know, try to live that down, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That never goes away. Um, no, no, it doesn't. Yeah. So if anyone out there wants to get involved with your book, your music, learning more about you, anything about your world, where can they go? Well, my website, uh, I have two of them, but the primary website is thealliman.com. And, uh, you know, that's certainly where people can reach out to me. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Spent a lot of time there every day connecting with like-minded professionals and colleagues. Uh, but they can find me on Instagram at thealliman, Coach Al on Twitter. Um, and of course, Facebook, isn't everybody on Facebook? I mean, it's, I'm easy to find on Facebook, um, uh, and all over the internet, in fact. So yeah, I would, uh, encourage folks to reach out. Uh, I always love to connect with like-minded people and, um, Joe, you know, I wish we could do this interview the other way around, man, because I'm curious about you. Yeah, sure. I, I like, I like to learn more about you and how you, how did you end up at this point in time hosting this show? Like what's, what's driving you to do that? You know, I. I was into sports broadcasting when I was in college and I just got to a point where I just didn't want to do it. There was just too much in there that just did not work or resonate with me. And I kind of stepped out, but I always had that broadcast stream. I mean, I was serious about it. So I bought a raccoon, a Radio Shack raccoon at a thrift store that had the radio in the belly. And I had just gotten a construction project down in my backyard with a pool and everything. And I hung it up and the song Kansas City comes out of it. And there's this guy that has a show called The Neon Beat. And it's like the American Songbook. His name is John Christopher. So I reached out and said, I love it. But I was doing part-time journalism at the time at a newspaper. And I said, let's interview. We interviewed. Just so happens he's four blocks away from my house. He says, why don't you write a script and come over to my house? I write a jazz <laughs> script, 2011. Right now this week, I'm on show 831. And I've always wanted to interview jazz musicians because I want to get the story from the musician. It's a very yeah. American story. And it should be a very centric musician fueled thing, not from a book, not my opinion from the musician. So that's yeah. been my aim. And then I got approached by this platform, um, Podmatch, and they said, do you want to do some other interviews? And I was like, sure. So I've kind of encapsulated all of it together. And that's kind of where we're at right now. That's the nexus of things. Yeah. So that sounds great. I mean, it sounds like you're, you know, you're doing something you really enjoy. I love it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's good stuff. But Al, it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking your time to give me your story. You're doing wonderful things. And uh, I appreciate it, man. Best of luck with everything. Well, thanks, Joe. I appreciate you having me on and having any interest in talking to me. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, and I look forward to connecting down the road, my friend. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Semi-love. This